Just remain standing, if you will, while we bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight for this another opportunity to come and present this glorious, marvelous gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank Thee because that He still remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank Thee for these people who have gathered out here in the time of this cold weather and still with their anticipations great, looking, believing that something extraordinary is going to be given us from God. We come with that hope, Lord, to ever meeting. We thank Thee for the services night before last at the tabernacle. Thank Thee for the service here last evening and for the service today at the tabernacle. We're looking forward now what you will have for us tonight. Father, we know that anyone that's able to move their hands could turn back the pages of the Bible, but there's only one who can make it live and be real, and that's you. Father, we're looking for you to do that tonight. Bless us in every way. Our hearts are so full of joy as we see the time approaching when we're going to meet him face to face, the one that we've loved and lived for all these years. Many new converts, Lord, has been made, understanding that a great host, 40 or 50, is to be baptized in your name in the morning from the service last night. Oh, God, please continue. We pray until every predestinated seed of God has seen the gospel light and has come into the fold. We ask you to hide us tonight behind the word, blind us to the things of the world, and let us see Jesus. May there be a Mount Transfiguration experience among us tonight that we see no man save Jesus only. We ask that in his name and for his glory and a vindication of his gospel. Amen. You be seated. I'm just going to turn this mic or this desk just slightly sideways if it's all right so that I can see both sides of the audience. I guess I can get these microphones around here, right? <laughs> all right, just a moment. We are greeting from the main auditorium here tonight our friends in Arizona, California, Texas, and across the United States by the way of telephone. This, this is going nationwide, this service tonight, by the way of telephone. So we trust that God will bless us. Can you hear back over to the, the auditorium to the left? All right, they're going to check now the telephone system to see if it's working. All right. Everybody happy tonight? Yeah. Oh, that's fine. On this side? Amen. I'm so glad to see that you're all seated comfortably. And now, tomorrow night, if the uh, crowds keep increasing, there'll also be telephone direct. There is tonight. I think some of them is down there at the tabernacle. And tomorrow morning, the services cannot be uh, had at the tabernacle because the, there'll be a floor there uh, uh, decorating the church for a wedding tomorrow afternoon. And um, they have transferred the, the services in the morning up to Brother Ruddle's church, one of our associates, and uh, up on the, the uh, highway here, 62. Uh, has it been announced? Yes. Has it been announced? If it overflows up there, we'll take the rest and send another minister down to Brother Junior Jackson's down in Clarksville. The reason we had it, Brother Ruddle's, is close here, and we, can, um, and, uh, we thought you could find that easier. And then we'll take care of it in some way. Be sure to get all those baptisms in for tomorrow. And I hope there'll be another hundred or two added to those for baptism tomorrow. And now, tomorrow night, I never like to announce anything you speak on ahead of time, but one night in the service, or one day, I want to speak on the subject of who is this Melchizedek? Because it's a... A subject that I think we're living in the time when these revelations, of which has been the question down through the age of who is this fellow, and I believe that God has the answer who he was. 
Some said a priesthood, some said a king, some... But there's got... As long as there's a question, there's got to be an answer to that question, which is right. Cannot be a question without first being an answer. Now, we trusting that God will give us a blessing tonight out of his word as we read it. And you've had... Billy told me to tell you that you sure had fine cooperation with the peoples here that's been in the parking system, the police and everything, keep it up. That's very, very good. We hope to see the time, maybe in the near future, when maybe we could bring the tent here to the city and put it up out here in the ballpark where we could stay for some length of time, maybe for three or four weeks revival constantly. Here, we just merely get to know each other and then we have to... um, say goodbye and we go again but I'd like to come and stay an extensive trip one time where you can stay so we don't have to uh, close out at a night or two but just stay and teach day and night day and night on and on maybe somebody go home and feed the chickens milk the cows and come back next week and continue home with the service I, I like that so the Lord be with you now before I leave Perhaps Sunday morning or Sunday night or sometime, one of these services, I know you're all waiting to hear the message on the truth about marriage and divorce, which is one of the great problems of the day. And I'm just as sure as I'm standing here, I believe that the correct answer is in the Word of God. And I believe that that's what I promised to come back for. And I suppose knowingly, as far as I know, I want to have another service here and Jeffersonville on Easter Sunday, and we'll for sunrise service, and then Easter Sunday. So we'll announce it ahead and try maybe to get the auditorium, if possible, or somewhere for Sunday. Maybe come Saturday and Sunday. Have to fly in and back out because it's near the time. I have to check it first with the schedule I have and one of my 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 itinerary in California, and then immediately after that I've got to go down into. To Africa. So um, keep in touch and pray for us. Now, tonight, I want to call your attention to a portion of God's Word found in the fourth chapter of St. Luke. The fourth chapter and the 16th verse, it will begin. Jesus speaking, this day is this Word fulfilled in your ears. Now, We want to draw from that a conclusion of how dynamic is the Word of God. Now, we all can figure out the mechanics, but it takes the dynamics to make it work. We can figure out what the mechanics of a machine, automobile, but then it takes the dynamics to make the wheels go to operating and moving. Now, Jesus had returned to to Nazareth where he was brought up. On down in the scriptures here, we find that they said, we heard you did such and such over Capernaum. Now, let us see you do it here in your own country. Jesus said, uh, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. And, of course, that's where you're brought up at and where people know you. And there he had a, a, a bad name to begin with by him being born without an earthly father. They called him an illegitimate child that Mary was actually pregnant before uh, she married officially Joseph. But that isn't so. We know it isn't so. And on this scripture, what caused me to fall my eyes upon this was uh, something that happened just recently in Phoenix, Arizona. It was the last uh, day of the service that I was to speak at the International Convention of the Full Gospel Businessman. And in this convention, there was a visitor with us, which was... um, Catholic bishop, which is uh, is, uh, of the Chaldean rites of the Apostolic Catholic Church, 
the most reverend John S. Stanley, OSD. Um, he is the Archbishop of Metropolitan United States in the Catholic Church. This had to be his card and his, and his address. And he was a visitor uh, with the Christian businessman. And I had seen there the day before, and when I was speaking on Saturday night, I believe it was, or Saturday morning at the breakfast, and I, as I was speaking, he uh, kept watching me. I thought, that man certainly is disagreeing with everything I say. And, um, you know, he could, you could just see me keep his head up and down, but I didn't know what was just exactly working on him. So on Sunday afternoon, when I got up to speak, I was going to take my text on birth pains, where Jesus said that as a woman in travail with a child, she's travailing in birth. And uh, so I was going to speak from there as birth pains, a subject saying that the world is in birth pains now. The old has to be done away with so the new can be born, just like a, a seed has to rot away in order to give new life. How the pains, birth pains, struck um, the world in World War I. She had a terrific pain because they had poison gas and so forth that almost could destroy the world. And in World War II, she struck another harder pain. They had blockbusters, and also an atomic bomb. She cannot stand another labor pain. With these missiles and things today, one more war will throw her out into space, for she will now be delivered, and there will be a new earth. The Bible said there will be. Under every prophet's message, Israel got a birth pain. Because these prophets had come on the scene after the theologians and clergymen would have the church all in organization form. And when that prophets come on the scene with, Thus saith the Lord, they shook them churches, and she had a birth pain. Finally, she had birth pains flown up until she delivered a son of the gospel, which was the word itself made flesh. So the church really is in birth pains tonight, again, for the deliverance of the Son, Son of God, to come again. All of our theologians, all of our systems, all of our denominations have rotted right out from under us. So we are in birth pain. And a message from God always throws a church in heavier pain. But after a while, she's going to be delivered of a bride that will bring forth Jesus Christ to his bride. And then, thinking this man had disagreed with me so much, when I raised up to speak this message... I turned in my Bible to find the page, and my wife had just given me a new Bible for Christmas. My old Bible is about 15 years old, and the thing was just about tore to pieces. The pages, every time it opened up and fly out of it, and, but I know just where to find every scripture. So I studied post in that Bible, and I just picked up the new one because the other looks so ragged to go to church with. And when I started to turn over in St. John, where the scripture was found, I started to read the 16th chapter, and the verse that I was looking for wasn't there. So I thought, strange. I turned back again. Still it wasn't there. And Brother Jack Moore from Shreveport, Louisiana, a bosom friend of mine, he was sitting there. I said, Brother Jack, isn't that found in St. John 16? He said, yes. And this Catholic priest got up out of his seat from about a hundred clergymen sitting on the platform, walked over close to me with all of his robes and gowns and crosses and so forth, and got right up close to me, and he said, My son, be steady. God is fixing to move. I thought a Catholic bishop telling me that. He said, Read it out of my book. And I read the scripture out of his book and took my text and went on. Preached my sermon. Afterwards, when I got through, he got up after I was gone and said, this one thing has to happen. After that, the church has to get out of the mess it's in, or we have to get out of the mess the church is in. <laughs> so one or the other. 
And uh, I was on my road home back down to Tucson. That evening, the kids was crying for a sandwich, and I stopped to get a sandwich and a little stand. And my wife said, Bill, I never was so nervous in all my life to see you stand up there fumbling through that Bible. I said, didn't it make you nervous? I said, no. I said, I know it was in there somewhere. They just didn't have the pages of misprint. And she said, to think that I got you that Bible, it looked like every eye in there was right up on me. And I said, well, you couldn't help that. There's a misprint in the Bible. I said, they just never put the page in. Well, I got down and looked at it again, just perfect as if it could be. But the 16th chapter ends portion, the portion of it just about three inches from the bottom. Over at the 17th chapter on the other side does the same thing. And being a new Bible, those two pages had perfectly stuck together. And I was reading from the 17th chapter instead of the 16th. Well, I said, that's all fine it's for some cause. And just as plain as you could hear any voice, a voice come to me and said he entered into Nazareth, the where he was brought up at, and went into the synagogue as it was his custom. And the priest gave him the scriptures to read. And he read Isaiah 61. And when he had read the scriptures, he sat down, handed the priest back the Bible, the book, and sat down and all the eyes of the congregation was up on him and precious words proceeded from his mouth and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. How accurate is the scripture? If you'll notice this, in Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, is where our Lord was reading from. Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, but in the middle of the second verse of Isaiah 61, he stopped, or said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the acceptable year. Then he stopped. Why? The other part to bring judgment didn't apply to his first coming, but his second coming. See, it didn't apply there. How the scriptures never make a mistake. They're always perfect. Jesus stopped just where the scripture stopped, because that was exactly what was to be vindicated in his day. Now, in that first coming, the second coming, he will bring judgment upon the earth, but not then. He was to preach the acceptable year. Notice the Messiah standing in the platform to identify himself with the word of promise for that age. How strange Amen. the Messiah standing up before the church. And look at these precious words when he says here, to preach the acceptable year. The acceptable year, as we all know as Bible readers, was the year of Jubilee. That when all slaves and prisoners, as they were uh, been taken prison, and it had to give a son to pay a debt, or a daughter to pay a debt, and they were in bondage. No matter how long they'd been in bondage, or how long they're supposed to stay there, when the year come of the Jubilee, when the trumpet sounded, every man could go free if he wanted to go free. You were free, you were no more slave. But if you desired to remain a slave, then you had to be taken down to the temple, stood by the temple post, and they took an awl and bored a hole in your ear. And then you had to serve that slave master the rest of your days. What a perfect example it is of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When it's preached the acceptable time and the time of jubilee, anybody, no matter who you are, what color you are, what denomination you belong to, how far you stooped in sin, or what's wrong with you, you can go free when you hear the gospel trumpet sound out. You are free. But if you turn your back upon the message and refuse to hear it, notice you were 
bored in the ear with an awe. That means to say that you have crossed the line between grace and judgment and you will never hear the gospel again. You'll never get any further. You must be a slave to the system you're in the rest of your days if you refuse to hear the acceptable year. Now, the other part of it, as I said, didn't need to be answered because this coming Messiah of time now is when he will bring judgment. Now, how could those people ever fail to see who he was? How did they ever miss it? How could it be when it was so plainly made known and showed? How could they have ever miss seeing when he, what a word. Think of it. This day is this scripture fulfilled before your eyes. Who said it? God himself. Who is the interpreter of his own word. This day is this scripture fulfilled. The Messiah himself standing in the presence of the congregation and reading a word out of the Bible pertaining to himself and then saying, today this scripture is fulfilled and they still fail to see it. What a tragedy that that would be. But it's happened. It's happened many times. How could it happen? Of course, like it did in other times, by believing man's interpretation of the word. That's what caused it. Those believers in them days, so-called believers, was taking the interpretation of what the priest had said about the scripture. Therefore, Jesus, not belonging to any of their ranks or their societies, he was uh, excommunicated from their company. And therefore, they could not identify him with them because he was different from them. The person of Jesus Christ was so unique that no one should have missed seeing it. That was the Son of God because he was a perfect identification of the Scripture that was wrought of him. It's the way any Christian is known. When his life identifies the very things that a Christian is supposed to do. How he could stand there and say, this day, this Scripture is fulfilled right before your eyes. How outstanding, how so plainly, and yet those people misunderstood. Why? It's because they took the interpretation of some order of priest that they were listening to. And history always repeats itself, and Scripture has a compound meaning to it, and a compound revelation. For instance, like it says in the Bible, that out of Egypt... I've called my son, referring to Jesus. Run the margin on that, you find out it also referred to Jacob. Same scripture. Jesus was his greater son. Jacob was his son, he called out of Egypt, which the Schofield reference and all other references give to it, because that's the scripture it was referring to. So it had a, a double answer. It had an answer to Jacob called out and to Jesus called out. And so is it today. It's because that we're in such a turmoil as we are and people fail to see the truth of God is because there's too many man-made interpretations of God's Word. God don't need nobody to interpret His Word. He is His own interpreter. God said in the beginning, Let there be light, and there was light. That doesn't need an interpretation. He said, a virgin shall conceive. And she did. That doesn't need any interpretation. When God's interpretation of his word is when he vindicates and proves it to be so. That's his interpretation by making it come to pass. That's where God's interpretation is. It's when he makes his word come to pass. He's interpreted it to you. Like if there had never been light, he said, let there be light, and there was. I don't need anybody to interpret. But we get man-made systems mixed into it. And when you do, you, you get it out of line. It's always been that way. 
But I still think of how striking it must have been. Think of it. The Messiah. Why did they fail to see him? Because they're very leaders that ought to have known him, that ought to have been versed in the Scripture, that ought to have been understanding of the Scriptures. They belittle this man and said he's an illegitimate child of, to begin with. We wouldn't believe that. Years later, we don't believe that. We would die for the purpose to say that he was a virgin-born son. And it'll come to pass someday that the very things that we see Jehovah doing today, men in the ages to come, if there is, will die for the thing that we're talking about today. You'll have to do it when the mark of the beast comes on and they're not allowed to preach the gospel this way. When the great union of churches comes together, which is in order right now for the world church, You'll have to seal your testimony with your own life to this. You must believe it now. If those priests could rise up and condemn him, would not condemn him. But you say, if I'd have been there, I would have done so and so. Well, that wasn't your age, but this is your age. This is the time. You say, well, if he was here, the Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same. So he is here. But he's sure as the world has civilized and become greater and educated more, he's sure in a spirit form, which they cannot kill or put to death. He died once. He cannot die again. He had to be made flesh in order for God to be put to death in the flesh for sin. But this time he can never die. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, how to think that they had them things against him. Another thing, that he would not join any of their ranks. Then you see, that still made him a bad person. He wouldn't join their, their organizations, wouldn't join their priesthood, and he wouldn't have nothing to do with it. And then besides all that, he tried to tear down what they had built up. He went into the temple. We call him a meat man. He was. But many times we misunderstand what meekness is. He was a man of compassion, but yet we fail sometimes to understand what compassion is. Not human sympathy isn't compassion, but compassion is doing the will of God. He passed through the pool of Bethesda, the gate. There lay people, multitudes of them. Multitudes is no certain number. But there lay multitudes, lean, blind, halt, withered. And he had compassion on the people always. And he went to one person. That was not lame, blind, halt, or withered. Maybe he had a prostrate trouble. Maybe he had some little infirmity that was retarded. He had it 38 years. It wasn't going to bother him. It wasn't going to kill him. He was laying on a pallet. And he said, Will thou be made whole? And a man said, I have nobody to put me in the water, but while I'm coming, well, someone steps down ahead of me. See, he could walk. He could see. He could get around. But he was just feeble. And Jesus said to him, Rise up! Take up your bed and go to your house. And Jesus' question on that. For you remember the scripture said this. No wonder if he'd come to Jeffersonville tonight and make an act like that, they'd still talk about him. But remember, he came to do one thing was the will of God. Now that's down in St. John 5, 19. You'll get the answer. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son. Now they ought to have known that that was the very vindication of the prophecy of Moses, for the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. Do you notice when he seen the man, he said Jesus knew that he had been in this condition for many years. See, being a prophet, he saw that man in that condition and went down there and waved waved his way around to those people, mincing to the crowd, until he found that certain man, passed by the lame, halt, blind, and withered, yet a man full of compassion. But compassion is doing the will of God. Now we find him, as he would not join up with them. He would not have nothing to do in their ranks. Then he was an outcast. He would not have any, besides that, he went into the temple one day. A man went in there and found the house of God. Just that contaminated as it is today. They were buying, selling, changing money. And he turned over the money tables 
duck ropes and plaid them and beat the money changers out of the temple and looked upon them with anger and said, it's written. Hallelujah. My father's house is a house of prayer. And you made it a day to feed. And you with your traditions has made the commandments of God of none effect. Oh, could a bunch like that ever believe in him? No, sir. They have been so hogwatered in the muck of societies and filth of the day until they were so ecclesiastical, froze up until they couldn't feel the vibrations of the power of Almighty God. No wonder a woman could touch his garment and get healed by it, and a drunken soldier could spit in his face and feel no virtue. Depends on how you approach it. Depends on what you're looking for. When you go to church, it depends on what you're looking for. Now, we see him standing there. No doubt but what the people had already warned him. Warned, the priest had warned the people. Now, he's coming over here next Sabbath. And when he does, don't you listen to him. Now, you might go and sit here, but don't pay no attention to what he says because he don't belong to our group. He's an outcast. He has no fellowship card. He don't even have an or- uh, organization paper with him. He doesn't have nothing like that. What is he? Some renegade boy that was born down here illegitimate birth by a carpenter's home that a mother conceived him before they were married and they're trying to hide the thing up with some supernatural thing. We know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll come down the corners of heaven and go to our high priest and say, here I am, Caiaphas. But we find out that he didn't do it that way because it wasn't written in the Word that way. It was a man-made tradition that caused him to believe that. The Word said that he would come just the way he came. There he stood reading the Word and saying to them, this day this Scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. And still they fail to see him or recognize him. Like he did in all other ages. Noah could have said the same thing the day that he entered into the ark and the door closed. Moses could have raised that window in the top of the ark, looked out upon the congregation, remembered God closed the door. And he could have said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. But it was too late for the man. He had preached 120 years to try to get him into that boat that he had built. Telling him that the scripture said, thus saith the Lord, it's going to rain. But they waited too long. But Noah could have easily said that. The day, this day, the scripture is fulfilled. Moses, the same day that the pillar of fire come down on Mount Sinai and give witness to his testimony. Moses could have said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled. Moses, you know, was a called man of God, a prophet. And while he was being called, being a prophet, he had to have a supernatural experience in order to be a prophet. He had to meet God face to face and talk with him. And another thing, what he said had to come to pass or no one would have believed him. So no man has a right to call himself thus until he's talked face to face with God on a backside of a desert somewhere where he met God himself. And all the atheists in the world could not explain it away from him. He was there. He knew it happened. Every Christian should have that experience before they say anything about being a Christian. Your own experience. I talked to my nephew a while ago, a little Catholic boy. He said, Uncle Bill, I've run from pillar to post, going everywhere, trying to find something. Night after night before this meeting started, he's been crying, and at night time, he's been dreaming dreams of coming in, running up to the altar. We're preaching and making a confession that he's been wrong. I said, Melvin, no matter where you try to go, how many churches you join, how many Hail Marys you say, or how many blessings you get from man, you've got to be born again by the Spirit of God. It's the only thing that will satisfy the human heart. That's I know they've got a substitute today of being born again to shake hands with the preacher and put your name on the book. But friends, that is a dogma. It's not a Bible truth. If it would, the Acts of the Apostles in the second chapter have to read like this. When the day of Pentecost is fully come, the pastor walk out and shook hands with the people. But said, when the day of Pentecost had fully come at the inauguration of the church, there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. 
That's how the Holy Spirit come the first time. That's how it's come every time since that time. He's God and changes not. Now, it's the most people. They say that was for another day. Well, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Every time the church ever received the Holy Ghost, it's always come like it did the first time. Under the same prescription, Acts 2.38. Never has changed, never will change. Like a doctor's prescription for a disease. You write out a prescription for a disease, the doctor doesn't take it to some quack druggist, and he puts too much of the antidote in it, it's so weak it won't do you any good. If he puts too much of the poison in it, it'll kill you. It's got to be wrote just according to the doctor. And the doctor's prescription on how to receive the Holy Ghost is given to us by Dr. Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost. Yes. I'll give you a prescription. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Yes. For the prescription is to hit them as far off, and even as in men is the Lord our God shall call. Yes. The eternal prescription. Moses had had this experience. He went down into the country. And he began to tell the people, I met a pillar of fire. He was in a burning bush and he told me to tell you, I am that I am. Amen. Go down, I'll be with you. Take up the stick in your hand and hold it up over Egypt. Whatever you ask, it'll be done. Well, probably some priest said nonsense. But when they seen the real facts of this take come to pass, they couldn't hold it any longer. They know he was sent of God. Amen. Then, if Moses said he saw that, and testified to it to be the truth, then God obligated, if that is the truth, to identify and vindicate that man's word, the truth. Amen. That's true. Amen. If Jesus Christ stood there and read that day, this day is this word fulfilled before you, God's obligated to make that word come to pass. We stand here tonight and say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's obligated to prove that to be so. Amen. Because it's His Word. Yeah. Now, what does it do? It takes faith in believing Him. It takes faith in believing His Word, that it is the truth. Notice what come to pass. When Moses brought the children out and all those that followed him, those who did not follow stayed in Egypt. But those who followed Moses, when they come out of the Red Sea and got out into the wilderness, God came down upon Mount Sinai. That pillar of fire set the whole mountain on fire. And a voice spoke out of there. God gave the Ten Commandments. Moses could have walked up there before the people and said, This day the scripture that I have told you as his prophet comes to pass. Amen. This day I told you that God met me and not buried in a burning bush in a pillar of fire. And he said, this, uh, this will be a sign. You'll bring the people right back to this place here again. And there's God in the same pillar of fire I told you was in, hanging right down on the mountain. Amen. This day, this prophecy is fulfilled. Amen. Here he is to vindicate that the things I've said is the truth. God, give us more man like that that's honest and sincere and tell the truth. That God Almighty could vindicate that his word is still truth. He remains the same yesterday and ever. Why wouldn't he do it? He promised to do it. Joshua, he might have said the same. The day that he'd come back to Kadesh Barnea, where they had journeyed so far in the wilderness... They were doubting the land being the kind of land that God said it would be. But God told them it was a good land. It was flowing with milk and honey. And Joshua and Caleb was the only two that would believe it. Out of the other ten that left, when they come back, they had the evidence. They had a bunch of grapes that two strong men could only carry. Joshua and Caleb could have stood right there and said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled. Here's the evidence that it is a good land. Yeah. Sure. Why? There's the evidence that it's a good land. Where'd you ever get such things as that? In Egypt. There was no such places. But this day, this scripture is fulfilled. He could have said the thing, same when he prophesied. And said the walls of Jericho would fall down as they marched around seven times. Seven days, seven times a day. And when they marched around that last time, the walls fell down. Joshua could have stood up and said, This day 
the chief captain of the host of the Lord that told me weeks ago that it would happen like this. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. Amen. There laid the walls flat on the ground. Come on, let's go take it. It belongs to us. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. How wonderful man of God has stood for the things that's right. Israel at the river, when they possessed the land, went over. How are they going to do it? It's the month of April. The floods are coming down because the snow is melting up in Judea. Oh, what a poor uh, general it seemed like that God was. To bring his people there in the month of April when the Jordan is higher back than it ever was. Sometimes I might get stopped here if I had time to give you just a little tip. Sometimes you may be sitting out with cancer. You might be sitting with a disease. You think, why me being a Christian would be in this way? Why would I be sitting like this if I'm a Christian? Sometimes God lets the things get so dark that you can't see up, around, or anywhere else. And then he comes and makes a way through it for you. She might say, this day, this scripture is being fulfilled. That he promised to do. He let the Hebrew children walk right into the fiery furnace. They said, our God is able to deliver us in this fiery furnace. But nevertheless, we'll not bow down to your image. When they walked out of there, the smell of the furnace upon them, no smell of the furnace rather upon them, they could have said, this day is this scripture fulfilled. Daniel comes from the lines then, he could have said the same thing. John the Baptist, after 400 years of ecclesiastical teaching, no one of that church was in a mess at that time. When he appeared in the wilderness of Jordan, he could have stood right down the bank as he did and say, this day, this scripture, Isaiah 40 is fulfilled. How I could stop here and tell you what that old priest told me. He said, son, you never finished that message. I said, keep still. He said, you mean that Pentecostals don't see that? I said, no. He said, I see it. And a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. He said, why didn't you go? And I said, keep still. He said, glory to God, I see it. And about that time, the Holy Ghost fell on his sister sitting out there in the meeting. And she raised up speaking in unknown tongues and gave the interpretation of the very thing that the priest and I were talking about on the platform. The whole church, the whole place went into a roar. Heard on over to Old Roberts Convention last week, or week before last, it was the talk of the convention. How did that priest sitting there, the Holy Spirit revealed out there through a woman, his sister, I believe it was, of what was taking place up there on the platform. And revealed that thing that we were hiding. The hour that we're living. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. This day, the evening lights have come. And we fail to see it. Notice, John said this day, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That said the prophet Isaiah, prepare the way for the Lord. They didn't understand. They said, oh, you're Jesus. You're, you're the Christ, rather. He said, I am not the Christ. He said, I'm not worthy to loose his shoes. But he said, he's standing among you somewhere. Or he was sure that he would be there. He'd be in his day because God told him he was to introduce the Messiah. One day a young man's come walking down through there and he's seen a, a, like a light over the top of him, a sign, and he cried out, Behold the Lamb of God. This day, this scripture is fulfilled before you. Sure. At the day of Pentecost, how Peter stood up and quoted the scripture of Joel 2.38. When they was all laughing, those people, they couldn't talk in their own language. They were jabbering off something else. The Bible said cloven tongues. Cloven is a parted tongue, not saying nothing. Just a jabbering, running around like a bunch of drunk people. And they all said, well, these people are drunk. Look at them. Look how they're acting. How them women and men, they're disorderly, said that religious group of that day. Peter stood up in the midst of them, said, Man and brethren, you that dwell in Jerusalem and you that dwell in Judea, let it be known unto you that these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's the third hour of the day. But this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. It'll come to pass in the last day. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. This day, this scripture was fulfilled. Certainly. Luther was right on time. Wesley was right on time. Pentecost was right on time. Nothing out of the order. Now... I asked you to consider the age and time we now live in with the promised word for today. If back in other ages, man could say this day, this scripture. This day, this scripture. Then what about the scripture for this day? What's promised for this day? 
Where are we standing? What hour are we living? When the clock is beating the scientific clock three minutes before midnight. World has got the jitters. The church is in a bed of corruption. Uh, nobody knows where they're standing. What time of day is it? What about the scripture for this day? The conditions of the church, the conditions of the church today in the world, politics, our world system is just as rotten as it can be. I'm not a politician, I'm a Christian. But I got no business talking about politics, but I just want to say they're rotten on both sides. I voted once. That was for Christ. I got to win. Amen. The devil voted against me. Christ voted for me. Depends on which way I cast my vote. I'm glad I cast it on him. Let the world say what they want to. I still believe that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll prove it. He certainly will. Certainly. The increase in crime, juvenile delinquency. Look at our nation. What's the flower of the earth? Our great democracy was formed back at and the, the Declaration of Independence. And Declaration of Independence is signed and we had a democracy. And our great forefathers and the things that they done. We had a great nation. But she is now rotten and crumbling and shaking and giving away and trying to tax people to get money to send over there to buy friendship with their enemies. Amen. They're throwing it back in our face. One world war, two world war, and still moving on to a third one. Certainly, politics is rotten, corrupted, rotten to the bottom. Just exactly what Matthew 24 said it would be. Nation to be against nation, kingdom against kingdom. All these things would take place. Let's consider this now. All right. Notice another. The increase in scientific research. Now, one time, just a, my grandfather went to see my grandmother in an ox cart. Now, it's a jet plane. Or even a, a, a orbit into the air, in the outer space. It's great. How, who said this? Daniel twelve four said, "Knowledge shall increase in the last days." We see the hour we're living. Notice uh, the the conditions of the world, the condition of science, and notice again today in our educational system. I don't try to deny this. I've got the newspaper clippings teaching sex. In our church, in our schools, of young students that have sexual affairs with one another to see if they can mate in the world. Yes, sir. How about in our priesthood? Tonight I got a piece out of the paper over in Los Angeles, California, of where a bunch of clergymen, Baptists and Presbyterians, ministers brought a bunch of homosexuals in and practiced homosexual. Saying they're trying to win them to God when that's why the curses of the hour, yes. a sodomite, and the law even arrested them. Now where are we at? Our whole system is rotten out from under us. I've seen the increase of homosexual across the United States has increased 20 or 30 percent over last year. Think of that. Man living with man, just exactly like they did in Sodom. Increase in crime, juvenile delinquency. What hour are we living? This day, this word of prophecy is fulfilled. The religious world, the church itself, the church, the called out church, that we call the called out church, the last church age, the Pentecostal church age, where is it? It's in Laodicea, as the scripture said. The day they've let down the bars, their women are half dressed, their men are... It's a horrible thing. Some of them married three or four times on deacon boards and everything else. They've let down and brought in corruption because they've set in councils and took the place with the world. And today, they got better buildings they ever had. Some place, one of them's building a $50 million auditorium. $50 million Pentecostals. It used to be down on the corner 25 years ago, beating a tambourine. Said we because, the scripture said in Revelation 3, that you are rich. Said I'm rich. I said as a queen I have need of nothing. And knowest thou not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, naked, blind. And don't know it. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. Amen. Amen means so be it. I'm not amening myself, but I mean I believe it's the truth. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. The Pentecostal church is in a lady of sea condition. 
Oh, they still jump and holler and carry on when the music's beaten. When the music stops beating or the beatneck music, some of them play and call it Christianity. And whenever that stops, all the glory's gone. It's a real praise of God. There isn't enough whistles and enough, enough power in the world to stop it. When it really comes from God, it don't take music to be beat up. It takes the Spirit of God to come down with it. And it's long forgotten. It. Because it clashed the gift of the Holy Ghost, uh, initial evidence of speaking in tongues, and I heard devils and witches speak in tongues. The Holy Ghost is a word of God in you that identifies itself by accepting that word. Outside of that, it can't be the Holy Ghost. If it says it's the Holy Spirit and denies one word of that Bible, it cannot be the Holy Spirit. That's the evidence whether you believe or not. Notice another great sign. The Jews are in their homeland, their own nation, their own money. A member of the United Nations. They got their own army. They got everything. They're in their homeland, which Jesus said, learn a parable of the fig tree. There they are, right back in their nation. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. The Jews in their homeland, this day, this scripture is fulfilled. The lady of see a church age. This day, this scripture, Matthew 24, is fulfilled. The world is in corruption. The whole thing, nations against nations. Earthquakes in diverse places. Great whirlwinds coming down, shaking the nations and so forth. Great disasters everywhere. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. Now, we found out the condition of the world. We see where the church normal, normal organization, denomination. We see where they are. We see where the nations are. And we see that this day, these promises is fulfilled. Now, but in this day... There is to come a super royal seed of Abraham. Yeah. That's exactly what it be. Would be a royal bride to the royal promised son. Yeah. As I spoke last night, it won't be a natural seed. It'll be a spiritual seed. There is to be a spiritual bride raised up, which will be the royal seed of the royal faith of Abraham's royal son. She is to come on the scene in the last days. And the time and the place... Is a promise is given to her. According to Malachi 4, a scripture, there is to rise a message that will shake the hearts of the people right back to the apostolic fathers again. There is to rise one on the scene in the power of Elijah. That will rise on the scene a wilderness man. That will come out and will have a message that will come right straight back to the word again. That's the hour that we're living in. Then consider, now I ask you this hour, you people here of Jeffersonville in 19 and 33, the supernatural light that fell down down on the river that day when I was baptized in 500 in the name of Jesus Christ as about a 20-year-old boy. What did it say, Jeffersonville? What was it at the foot of Spring Street there? When the Courier Journal, I believe it was the Louisville Hurdle, packed the article of it, it went from across the Associated Press, come into Canada. Dr. Lee Bale cut it out of the paper, way up in Canada. In 1933, when I was baptizing my 17th person under this witness, and you know the rest of the story. And I stand there baptizing this 17th person, a light come down from heaven, shining down above there like a star falling from heaven. A voice said, as John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of Christ, your message shall forerun his second coming of This day, this scripture. This day is one around the world. And when God came down there and said that when I was a little boy in a burning bush or a bush up in our own fire with a pillar of fire up here at Watson's place on the Utica Pike, packing water back there from that barn to the moonshine still. You know the truth of it. He said, Don't you never smoke or drink or defile your body, for there's a work for you to do when you get older. I testify to that being the truth that I saw it. And God, as it did with Moses, spoke out before the congregation down there and said, This is the truth. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in the midst of us. Watch what he said about the discernment and how it would be. 
from laying hands upon to knowing the secret of the heart. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. Before our very eyes, these promises that was made. Notice, all these promises have been vindicated and fulfilled by the God of the promise. Look, hanging in Washington, D.C. tonight, the picture of the angel of the Lord. As George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI, fingerprint and document for the United States government, examined it from Houston, Texas, and said, this is the only supernatural being that has ever photographed in all the world. Amen. He ought to know he's the best that's in the world. Or, notice, that hangs as a truth, the same pillar of fire that led Israel back down in the wilderness Amen. is leading today the same kind of of come up out of Egypt. Oh, your this day... This scripture is fulfilled. You know the message that he said. Look at the vision of Tucson. Three years ago. When standing up here on the lane. When five years before that he said the day that the city drives a stake down in front of that gate. Turn yourself towards the west. My tabernacle of folks in here knows that, prop, uh, that time. Amen. That's right. And the day that Mr. Goings Lamb was up there and drove that stake down. I said to the wife, is something about this? She said, what is it? Now, when he looked in my little book, there it was. And that next morning at 10 o'clock, sitting in my room there about 10 o'clock, the angel of the Lord came down. He said, go to Tucson. You'll be northeast of Tucson. And there will come seven angels in a cluster that will shake the whole earth around you. And said, it'll be told you from there. How many remembers that year? Way before it happened. There's man sitting right here in this building tonight, was standing right there when it happened, and said the seven seals of the hidden mysteries of the entire Bible will be open and fulfill Revelations 10 that in the seventh angel's message these things should come to pass. This day, this scripture is fulfilled before our eyes. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. Last year, standing in the same place, Mr. Wood, here and I, going up the hill in a kind of mourning about his wife being sick, the Holy Spirit said, pick up a rock. Laying there, throw it up in the air. When it comes down, say, thus saith the Lord. There will be judgment strike the earth. Tell him that he'll see the hand of God in the next few hours. I told Mr. Woods is present tonight. And I guess eight or ten of the men of fifteen that was there at that time when it took place the next morning where the Lord came down in a whirlwind and ripped the mountain out around us and cut the tops of the trees loose and made tree blasts and said, Judgment is headed towards the West Coast. Amen. Two days after that, Alaska almost sunk beneath the earth. And since then, up and down the coast, the belches of God's judgment against that spiritual screen. There is a arm curtain. There is a bamboo curtain. And there is a sin curtain. Civilizations travel with the sun. So has the gospel. They've come from the east and went west like the sun goes. And now it's on the west coast. It can't go no further. If it goes further, it'll be back east again. The prophet said, there will come a day that cannot be called night or day. A dismal day. A lot of rain and fall. Just enough how to know how to join a church or put your name on a book. But it shall be light about the evening time. Yeah. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. The same, the same S-U-N that rises in the east is the same S-U-N that sets in the west. And the same S-O-N of God that come in the east and vindicated himself as God manifested in the flesh is the same S-O-N of God in the western hemisphere here that's identifying himself among the church tonight the same yesterday today. The evening light of the sun has come. This day, this scripture is fulfilled before us. Where are we at in this Abrahamic age? Where are we in this great time we're standing? The great hour that we're living? All the visions has been fulfilled. How about a little minister, friend of ours here, associate sister church, Junior Jackson, come running up to us one night and be down there and said, I had a, a dream, Brother Bramus, bother me. I seen all the brethren gathered upon a hill. 
and set upon this hill. You were teaching us out of letters that was wrote, looked like, and some letters that time had carved out in the rock. When you finished that, all that was finished. You told us, said, come close. And we all gathered up. Said, you reached from somewhere and looked like got like a crowbar and whipped the top of this little pyramid open. And when it did, said, granite rock with no writing on it. And you told us to look in upon this. And you all, we all started looking, said, I turned my head and I noticed you going towards the west, just as hard as you could towards the setting of the sun. How many remembers it? And I stood there a little bit till the Holy Spirit revealed it. I said, the entire Bible as much has been revealed to man through justification, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Ghost, the baptism in Jesus' name and all these things has been revealed. But there is secret that's hid inside because the Bible's sealed with seven seals. I must go there to find it. That morning when those seven angels come down and blasted the earth and rocks through every way, seven angels stood there and said, Return back to Jeffersonville from where you come from, for the seven seals of the seven mysteries will be opened. Yeah. Here we are today understanding serpent seed. In a few days, of God willing, we'll understand the correctness of marriage and divorce and all these things that God's opened every seal of the mysteries yeah. since the foundation of the world. And we've been enjoying the presence of His blessings. Yeah. That is true. This day, the scripture, the Life magazine packed an article of it. Mystic circle of light goes up in the air above Tucson and Phoenix. In the same way that I told you nearly a year before it happened, how it would be in a, like a triangle. The picture hangs in the church down there. You took that magazine, has it. There it was just exactly. It said it's 27 miles high and 30 miles across. They don't understand yet what happened. It appeared mysteriously and went away mysteriously. Brother Fred Sotman, Brother Gene Norman, and I stand there, three as a witness. I get up on the top of the mountain, Peter, James, and John. They give witness, stood there and watched it when it happened and seen it done. There it is hanging in the sky. So far, there's no humidity, no moisture, nothing to make them a fog. How could it come there? It was the angels of God returning back after their message. This day, that prophecy has been fulfilled in our midst. This day, this scripture has been fulfilled. Watch. Seven seals has been opened. The whirlwinds to the west coast. Now don't miss it like they did back yonder. Now our attention a little closer to our day. What does the scripture say about today and about the time we live in? Jesus speaking. I won't have time to take them all, but I want to take this one before we close. Jesus said in St. Luke, the 17th chapter, the 30th verse, Jesus Christ, the Word Himself, do you believe that? Jesus Christ, the Word Himself, made flesh, spoke and said what the Word would be in the end time. What would be the sign of the end of the world? He told him nation would rise against nation, but He said, as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the day of when the Son of Man is being revealed. Now, when Jesus came to the earth, He came in the name of three sons. Son of Man, which is a prophet. Son of God and Son of David. Now, He lived here on earth. He never did say He was the Son of God. He said, I'm the Son of Man. Jehovah Himself called Ezekiel and the prophets Son of Man because He had to come to fulfill Scripture as a prophet. Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. That's the reason he could not be the son of God there, because he was a son of man. He, the word came to the prophets, and he was the word in his fullness. Amen. Son of man, the, the major prophet, not the major prophet, but the God prophet. Amen. The fullness of the Godhead bodily was in him. Therefore, he was a son of man. Now, for 2,000 years, he's been known to us as son of God, spirit. And in the millennium, he'll be son of David up on the throne. We all know that. He'll believe the scriptures. Now, Jesus said, just at the end of this church age that we're living in, that the Son of Man would be revealed again in the same manner it was as it was at Sodom. Watch how historically he gave it. He said, as it was in the days first of Noah. Now, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Then he brought next the last to the Son of Man at Sodom. Because there he was dealing with Jews. Here at Sodom he's dealing with Gentiles. There he drowned them all by water in judgment. Here at the Gentiles he burned them all at the day of Sodom. 
That's right. The Gentile world burnt there. And so will it be when the Son of Man reveals. There's not no more water, but it'll be fire this time. Jesus read from the same Genesis 23 that we read from when he read about Sodom. Now, we admit the conditions that spoke of of the world condition of Sodom, Sodomites, Sodom condition. We, everyone will say amen to that. We believe that. All right? And the spiritual condition of Lady Osea, the church natural, we'll say amen to that. And accept their signs. We know that every sign is there. The church is in Lady Osea. We know that. We know the world is in a Sodom condition. Is that right? Amen. We'll accept that. But what about the sign of Abraham, the one waiting for the promised son? That was another. Remember, they had a Sodom back there. They had their messenger. And Abraham had a messenger to him. Abraham was waiting day by day for a, almost an impossible thing to happen. Sarah, 90, and him 100. According to the promise of God, he was still waiting in the midst of all criticism. He was waiting for that son. So is a true believer. Still waiting for that promised son to return. Notice, just before the son arrived, there was a sign given him. Is not the sign of the coming son to be revealed to the royal seed of Abraham that's waiting for the royal son, as same as it was to father Abraham for the natural son? Is that right? Amen. Jesus said so here in St. Luke 17, 30. Before this time come that the Son of Man would be revealed. Like he did in the days of Sodom before the destruction of Sodom. Now we're looking for a sign. Now let's take the conditions of time as it was in Sodom. Notice that all went out in Sodomite. The world. I think one of the movie directors put on a picture not long ago. And I got to see it. That was Sodom. If you ever see it, there's nothing else on but that. Take a look at it. It's a, certainly a good picture of the United States today. Hollywood. Just exactly the same kind of dressing. Everything else that they did is right then. Big drunken sprees and everything else. A religious cult of people. So-called religious. Notice. And Sodom had a witness. And it was a fellow by the name of Lot. Which was just a nephew to, to uh, Abraham. Now, Abraham did not go down in Sodom. He and his group, he had a big group with him, enough to fight off about a dozen kings in their army. So he had a big group with him, and he was sitting out there under an oak tree. One day, when everything was going wrong for him, nobody had anything to do with him, but he was still holding on to that promise. Watch now, closely before we close. While he was sitting there, down come three men walking to him. Two of them went down into Sodom and preached the gospel to them to come out to Lot. Is that right? But one stayed with Abraham. Notice the one that stayed with Abraham was God himself. The other two were angel messengers. Now down in Sodom they've done no miracles. Only smiting the blind and preaching the gospel always smites the blind. Now look, it's a set of that day. There is a church natural. Always in threes, as I said last night, God is represented. There were Sodomites, the Lotites, and the Abrahamites. It's in the same position tonight. The world's setting just like that. Let me ask you something. Look at this setting now. Abraham called this man that talked to him Elohim. The Hebrew word Elohim means the all-sufficient one. The one that's the eternal one. Elohim. God himself. In the beginning, Genesis 1 said, in the beginning, God. Take the Hebrew word there, in the Greek word rather, in the beginning, Elohim. Create heavens and earth. Here he is, Genesis about 22, here he says again, or, or about uh, 20, he said, and he called this man's name Elohim. Why did he do it? God represented in a human flesh that sat down with Abraham and eat a calf sandwich, drinking some milk and eat some bread. God himself and disappeared right before Abraham. But he gave him a sign. Notice, and that sign was that he had his back turned to the tent. And remember, 
Abraham, his name was Abram a few days before that. And Sarah was Sarah before that. S-A-R-R-A. Then S-A-R-A-H-M, A-B-R-A-M to A-B-R-A-H-A-M. Abraham means father of nations. Now watch real close here. And we'll see the setting of the hour that we're now living. As Jesus told us to look for this setting, we've seen all the rest of it, right? Now let's see to the royal sea. What setting they're supposed to see. Now, this man said, Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? And Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. Now, he had never seen her. How did he know that his name was Abraham? How did he know her name was S-A-R-A-H? Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? Said she's in the tent behind you. He said, I... Ah, personal pronoun. I am going to visit you according to the promise. Your wife's going to have that baby. You trust me now. I'm going to make it come to pass. And Sarah in the tent behind, eavesdropping or eardropping or what you call it, listened to the tent. She said, laughed up her sleeve and she said, Now I'm me, an old woman like I am. Have pleasure, my Lord, and him old too, out there, 100 years old. Wow, this hasn't happened for many, many years. And the man, M-A-N, sitting there eating in human flesh, drinking and eating like an ordinary man with dust on his clothes and had dust on his feet, and Abraham washed it off. God himself looked around and he said, Why did Sarah laugh back in the tent saying this? He knew, could discern the thoughts of Sarah in the tent behind him. Yes. Is that right? right? Now when the royal seed of Abraham come on the earth, what sign did he show? Son of man. Simon came up to him one day. Andrew brought him. He said, your name is Simon. You're the son of Jonas. He said, I made a believer out of him. Philip went over and got Nathaniel. Come back and said, come see a man who we have... We've found Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. He said, now, wait a minute. Could anything good come out of that fanaticism? He said, come see. So when Philip came up in the presence of Jesus with Nathaniel, Jesus looked over at him and said, behold, an Israelite in whom there's no guile. He said, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree. I saw you. He said, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. You're the king of Israel. When the little woman at the well in her immoral condition come up a little panoramic something like this to draw some water, Jesus had sent his disciples away to get fiddles. When she come up to draw water, he said, bring me a drink, woman. She said, it's not customary for you to say that. We have segregation here. Now, you Jews have nothing to do with us Samaritans. We have nothing to do with you. He said, but woman, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. I'd give you water as you don't come here to draw he found where her condition was, what it was. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, you said the truth. You've had five. And the one you're living with now is not yours. She said, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll show us these things. Jesus said, I am he. On that she run into the city and said, come see a man who's told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? Watch, he did that before the Jews and the Samaritans, but never the Gentiles. The Gentiles, we people, were heathens in them days. The other nations packed a club on her back, worshiping idols. We wasn't looking for no Messiah. He only appears to those who is looking for him. And we're supposed to be looking for him. But those who claim to be looking for him, the church itself, when they seen that done, they said he's a devil. He's a fortune teller. A Beelzebub. And Jesus said that sin would be forgiven them because he hadn't died yet. But said someday the Holy Ghost will come and do the same thing and to speak one word against it will never be forgiven. That's this day where every word has to hang together. Speak a word against it will never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. That was the royal seat of Abraham. And here that royal seat of Abraham which come because of that identification of that man sitting down there with Abraham come to prove it was the same God Promise that in this day as it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man when He is revealing Himself as Son of Man. Amen. 
This is the day for the scripture to be fulfilled. Look at the setting we are today. Look at the church where the Son of God. Look at the dismal day. Look at all the prophecies. Now, a strange thing. Our businesses are due then if the setting has to be like it's Sodom. There were three of them come along. Three outstanding men sent from heaven. We'll admit that. Three of them. One stayed with Abraham. They all started there. But one stayed with Abraham. The rest of them went out in Sodom. Is that right? And Abraham had a changed name from Abram to Abraham. True? Not one time has the history of church of the world ever had an evangelist to go to it with a name ending in H-A-M to this day. Billy, G-R-A-H-A-M. Is that right? G-R-A-H-A-M, six letters. A-B-R-A-H-A-M is seven letters. But G-R-A-H-A-M is six letters, which is the word of man. See? Look what's went out there today. Is that messengers from heaven? Is there a man on earth that's got repentance so preached so plainly as Billy Graham? Has there been a man that has had an effect upon the people like Billy Graham? Never has there been internationally a man on Billy Sunday and so forth as here in the United States, but Billy Graham's known worldwide. See where he's calling? Out of Sodom. And he's got his company and party there with the Pentecostal church on Oral Roberts. But what about the elect group? What kind of sign are they supposed to see? What are they supposed to have? Hallelujah! It shall be light in the evening time. This day, this scripture is fulfilled. This day, God's promise is fulfilled. We know that to be the truth. He's here tonight as he was then. Not a preach it. That I said a while ago, if you preach anything and it's a gospel truth, then God's obligated to vindicate that. Is that true? Now, if that be so, let the God that wrote the word, let the God that made the prophecy, let the God who is God of the word come forth. As Elijah went up on the mountain watching, Elisha went watching Elijah. He said, I want a double potion. And the mantle that was on Elijah fell off on Elijah. He walked down and doubled that blanket up and struck the river and said, where is the God of Elijah? And the same thing that happened for Elijah happened for Elijah. And the same gospel, the same power, the same son of man that was yesterday is today and will be forever. You believe it? And I ask you, I cannot be him, but he is here. We are only a carrier. Some of you people out there that's sick and afflicted, that you know that I don't know you. Let God, now if I can humble myself enough, you pray and ask God. I don't guess there isn't a prayer card in the building, is there? No, I don't, we never give out any prayer cards. We're going to have prayer meeting at our healing the sick at the church. But you pray. You know that I'm a total stranger to you. See, you know me, Jeffersonville. I don't want people from Jeffersonville to do that. I want people from away from here somewhere. See if God still reveals. See if he's still the same yesterday and forever. Do like the little woman did. He passed through and she said, I believe this man. She had a blood issue. And she said, if I can touch the bar of his garment, I believe I'll be made whole. Is that right? Because of her faith, that day the scripture was fulfilled. He bind up the heart of the broken heart, heal the sick and the lame. When she touched his garment, walked out and sat down, he turned around and said, who touched me? How do you ever know in that great throng of people? Probably 30 times watch here tonight. Thousands of them. How did he know it? He said, who touched me? He didn't say that just to be saying. He said that because it was true. And he said, who touched me? Directly looked around, seen the little woman where she was sitting or standing, whatever position she was in. Told her her blood issue was over. That was Jesus yesterday. That's him today. Amen. Amen. 
You believe that? I don't know you. God does. But you got pains in your side that's bothering you. That's right. You're sitting there praying about it. Am I a stranger to you? We're a stranger when I stand up if it is. I don't know you. It's this man right here on the corner, this young fellow. You also got a bad throat. That's right. You're praying about that. You're all nervous about something. You're going to have to leave the meeting because you're a minister. You got some engagements you got to take care of. That is right. Mm-hmm. You believe God knows who you are? Reverend Mr. Smith, now you can go and be healed. Jesus Christ made you whole. <laughs> Walk to your meeting. Your throat won't bother you. Who did he touch? There's a man sitting right back here. He's suffering. He's got a tumor on his left lung. He doesn't... He isn't from here. You have been a mind worker. That is right. I'm a total stranger to you. That's right. Shake your hand. The tumor's in your left lung and you're up for an operation right away. That's right. Hmm? You're not from here. You're from out of town. You're from Virginia. That's right. You believe God knows who you are? Mr. Mitchell? Right? Go home, be well. Jesus Christ makes you whole. Ask the man. Never seen him in my life. He's sitting there praying. This day, this scripture. Here's a lady sitting right back here behind me. As Sarah was in the tent. She's praying for a, a daughter. Stand up. The daughter's not here. She's away. The daughter. Uh, you're the same as it was when a woman come to Jesus who had a woman that was variously vexed with the devil. The woman is, the girl is demon possessed. She's not here. She is from, uh, you're from North Carolina. You believe that? And that's the truth, isn't it? Miss Orders, you can go home. If you believe with all your heart, you'll find your daughter like found when Jesus Christ in the days gone by. Said it was this day, this scripture, the sign of Sodom, the sign of the super seed, the sign of the natural church. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your midst. Do you believe it? Will you accept him right now as your Savior and healer? Stand up to your feet, every one of you. Say, I accept my healing. I accept him as my Savior. I accept him as my King. Each one, stand to your feet. This day... Listen, friends. He read the scripture, handed the Bible back to the priest, and said all the eyes of the people were fastened upon him. And he looked upon him and said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled. I've read the scripture with a dozen or more evidences that we're living in the last day. The generation that will see Jesus Christ return to the earth. And I say to you tonight, again, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your sight. You in Tucson, you in California, you in New York, on these telephone hookups, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your sight. Let us be glad and make merry. For the marriage of the Lamb is at hand, and her bride, his bride, has made herself ready. Let's raise our hands and give him glory.